Um, I'll, I'll get right to it. Uh, how have you been over the past year with uh, with COVID and lockdowns and all of that? Um, we've been doing all right. We've been uh, hunkered down here in Squamish. So, uh, and uh, my wife uh, Monique Perto has been busy putting the bones of our production company together. So, when everything lifts, we'll hit the ground running, getting a slate of ideas and slate of projects together, and yeah, putting up the you know putting on the bones of the uh, the company and all that fun business stuff. <laughs> uh, tell me a bit about the company. It's called Through and Through Films. Through the long way and then through and through the short way. So it's, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so we, we're, we're looking for, uh, we're international uh, co-productions is what we're focusing on. And uh, we uh, offer our skills as producers and writers, directors, and and uh, yeah, that kind of, that kind of business <laughs> and executive producers. Thanks. Executive <laughs> producing, producing. Nice. Yeah. You can send you a link if you want to afterwards. Yeah, that would be great. Absolutely. Okay. Um, perfect. Yeah. Uh, and I guess uh, the next question uh, is in regards to, and I hope I pronounce it correctly. Um, were you surprised to get the, the August, is it Schelling, Schellenberg award? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I guess kind of a surprise to to get that. Uh, were you quite shocked when they when they let you know? It was a very nice surprise. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was close friends. Uh, I was good friends with Augie and uh, Joan and, and the family. So it was quite a it's quite an honor to uh, to receive that uh, recognition, and just joining you know the the previous winners who've been involved uh, with it before. So you know it was is a very personal uh, a high point in my career being you know. Getting award uh, named after Augie is uh, just uh, incredibly special. So, uh, have you, yeah, uh, quite thrilled. Was, was there any kind of like? I guess it's kind of hard with COVID. Was there any kind of ceremony, or did they kind of just uh, send no, it to it you in the mail? Virtual, or... right? Okay, they did. <laughs> yeah, they sent it to me in the mail, but we did a uh, they did a virtual uh, uh, a, a video acceptance speech, and uh, yeah, and they let me know by email, and then. Uh, did I do? Oh, well, did a, a a panel for Imaginative, mm -hmm. so I did a, a panel on there, and um, and then uh, yeah, then they sent it in the mail, and we've just been spreading the word via social media. Nice. Uh, and so season three of Corner Gas Animated just finished a couple of weeks ago, I think. So uh, in mm -hmm. regards to that, is it uh, is it a bit of an adjustment to portray Davis uh, from live action to voice acting? It is because voice acting requires different uh, different set of skills. So you have to be really conscious that you're uh, telling the story with your voice. So when you're where we're recording, we have actually act, add physicality to our delivery to help with the sound and stuff. So it's a it's, it's a bit of a, a shift that way. But he's always a fun character to play. He's very you know he's uh is just trying to plug into that. Uh, that Davis switch that I got somewhere hidden in all the wiring. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it a bit difficult with uh, with COVID? Because I've seen pictures before where you guys are all together, mostly uh, kind of interacting with each other. But with COVID, obviously, we can't really do that. So, is it a bit yeah, more it was, difficult? Yeah, it was a lot. It? it was a lot more fun when before COVID because uh, it was nice to be in the studio with everybody. We had a lot of laughs and. Uh, We'd be doing a lot of goofing around, and they'd be going, "Okay, okay, let's uh, go." Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, we got to go to work now. But you know, so I miss hanging out with those uh, with my my favorite people, and uh, so yeah, making the adjustment, it, it's a bit. It takes. I wouldn't say it's just a little more of a challenge because I can hear. You know, we do it uh, basically four people at a time. So sometimes I get to do all my scenes with Tara. And I hear her in Toronto and Eric in Toronto and Brent's in the other studio down the, down the hall. And then that's about it. And then we wait and then we, it's all scheduling now, the challenge of scheduling and, and then other people come in and they clean up the studio before you go, you go in. So there's a bit of a time gap to hang out. And so it is, uh, it, it is, uh, I'm glad we're still doing it, but yeah, the COVID has certainly, certainly put a kink into it. Uh, are you looking forward to uh, to doing a season four uh, with how successful it has been over the past three seasons? Yeah, I, I, I could I could keep doing the show for as long as people want. I mean, it's so much fun, and the writers are doing an incredible job, and the animators at uh, Smiley Guy Studios are, are are a brilliant bunch of people, and they're just adding, you know, adding more to the characters that we've developed over the 
six years plus movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it's a great show. I've loved it since I first started watching. Yeah, it. yeah, no, it's years fun. ago. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, um, I, yeah. COVID has really put a dent in things because uh, I was doing another show called FBI Most Wanted mm-hmm. down. In, it's a Dick Wolf show, and I've got a recurring role in that. And uh, I did it at uh, I did season two, beginning of season two. I went down to New York to film, and. Uh, the protocols were pretty, it was pretty intense because I had to go through three airports to get there. So that was a bit nerve wracking. Um, it was nice to see that most of the airports were kind, kind of empty. So it not attacked as usual. So that was comforting. And, you know, Air Canada does a great job with their protocols and making sure everyone's masked up and gloved up. And so that, that was exciting. Um, and then onset protocols are quite uh, stringent down there as well. I think they are everywhere, but uh, Dick Wolf, and their, their company certainly took it an extra a mile. So I was like, I've been tested there so much while I was waiting <laughs> to work mm-hmm. twice a day. And, uh, you know, before you show up on set, before you even get out of the van, you get a temperature reading and then you get taken to a rapid COVID place and get tested there. And then if you're clear, then you're taken into set with two people per van. So there's a big 15 seater van and there's only the driver and two other actors max. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's it, the distance keeping us apart from each other is kind of it's the hard thing mm-hmm. but you know nobody wants to spread this virus so we're all mm-hmm. abiding by it and when you get to set there's pod areas you belong in pod a you can't go visit people in pod b or pod c there's you have to stay within your pod so <laughs> you know and there and we have covid police walking around to make sure everyone's um you know abiding by the rules Jeez, um, and, it, and it's yeah and it's work it's work i mean it's it's work because mm-hmm. you know we can't mess around this virus is is uh we can definitely stomp down the the spread of it if we everyone just adhered to wearing a mask washing your hands keeping social distance you know basic non-intrusive mm-hmm. exercise and i don't know why people resist i mean it's uh it's personal freedom is not a good enough personal freedom doesn't give you the freedom to infringe on my health Absolutely. threaten my health or my family's health so it boggles the mind why <laughs> yeah people would get the message we, you know we could be in a but much better shape than mm-hmm. than we are right now instead of watching numbers go up we could be watching them flatten out would be awesome without a doubt uh in regards to fbi most wanted uh like in canada obviously everybody knows you as, as sergeant davis but uh, you also have a habit of popping up in things like we had mentioned before with canada people's history and then i was watching fargo and uh, suddenly mm-hmm. you were you're getting your uh, teeth uh, worked on by billy bob thornton <laughs> uh but is it a kind of a change to to do something with somebody like dick wolf and a serious uh, show like that that is so far removed from the character of of davis I, I love it. That's what I look for. I love, I love, uh, I go look for those challenges, change of paces. Cause I can, you know, you can only play Davis for so long before you, it's like, okay, we're, I need, I need more depth. I need to flex my acting muscles more than, than, uh, than playing Davis. I mean, he's great. He's fun, but he's very, he's two dimensional character. So, you know, the challenge is, is uh, bringing life and making him believable in his two dimensional world. Cause he doesn't have a lot of depth. We don't have a back long big back history that you know for him and stuff we never see his family come up and visit him and that uh, kind of stuff so um so yeah so uh dick i uh, i didn't audition for the dick wolf show they just reached out to me after they saw uh, uh my body of work as uh, jonathan strauss said they, they saw their body of work and they just offered me the role because uh they didn't want me to audition for a one-line character they said we just rather give it to you we didn't want to you know, insult you by asking you to audition. <laughs> and I went, oh, that's so weird. <laughs> that's so American. That's awesome. <laughs> if that was more here in Canada, we'd be working all the time. But you know, that's the sad <laughs> thing about the state of state of acting in this country and in, in mm-hmm. Canada is, you know, you know, Eric uh, Peterson and and uh, Corinne Coslo, they they go through the same thing. You know, they're masters at the craft, and then they go to the audition room with people who are just starting and stuff. So it's a bit of a bit of a slap in the face for all the work and body of work that you have behind you, you know, a 30 year career for in various medias. And then you get relegated to being treated like you're just beginning and you have to prove yourself to some what behind the ears producer who just came in, you know? So it's, yeah, it's, it's a bit uh, insulting and, and hard, but that's, that's Canada. Yeah. You know, we don't, uh, we don't like to have a star system. 
<laughs> uh, so this year has been kind of a, a big year in terms of honors. You, you got the award, but then also, uh, actually, I'm just outside of Edmonton and at the Roxy Theater in Edmonton. Uh, you there's there the the Black Box Theater is being named after you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's another huge honor. You know, uh, my friend Bradley Moss and I we went to university together, and we we did a lot of work at uh, at, at his theater that he's running, the Roxy Theater Network. And uh, I've done, and that was that was my my haven, because I would do a season of Corner Gas, and then me and Brad would put in plans that let's do this show, so it would fall <laughs> between. So right after I would you know do Davis, and then I would go do Sam Shepard, Drew West, you know, total flip of <laughs> uh, a character and more. So it was very interesting because I remember the first scene, um, in Sam Shepard's True West. I don't know if you know the play, but uh, two brothers and uh, one's a writer and the other guy's a drifter you know a uh, dangerous drifter kind of dude and that's who I was playing and I knew we had this opening scene he said and then you just and and then we'd be waiting and I'd wait in rehearsal and then Brad would say okay you know you come in right now I said no well I said I will but I know this is what we have to do you have to give me a chance to set up my character because the audience won't go along with me when we they first see me. They're going to see me and they're going to go, oh, there's Davis. Oh, there's Davis. <laughs> so I got it. I had to take that first few minutes of just pacing around, you know, downing a bit, crashing it, just getting let, and then look at glare at the audience. So they go, OK, that's not Davis. That's <laughs> not a that's not somebody I want to mess with. Is that <laughs> and then they would be in for the ride, you know, and then they mm -hmm. enjoy the rest of the show. And I had people come up afterwards and say, no, I like you better as Davis. <laughs> you know, but uh, that's that's where my joy is, is, is playing a diverse range of characters and uh, always looking for that challenge, always looking for uh, people who can push me and stretch me and, and, and I can learn off of them, you know. Mm -hmm. That's why my, uh, my wife and I, we when we're in our production company, our focus is to work with uh, veterans, industry uh, veterans who've been around so it brings our game up as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, and we're totally capable and and, uh, and waiting to get into that uh, international co-pros and, you know, th those kind of things. Um, in regards to Davis, a, a little while ago, I did an interview with Jackson Davies and I asked him about playing Constable John. And it's kind of similar to da uh, Sergeant Davis where it's kind of a, not a goofy character, but it's kind of, I guess what has the response been from the RCMP to your character? Because you you know you don't portray him as the super serious do south character. He's kind of a you know a sweetheart, a goofy character, uh, but with a heart of gold. Has their response to it been pretty good? It's been it's been awesome. That was my first concern in the first season. Was I didn't want to um, seem like I was. Uh, uh, being disgra uh, disgracing the RCMP or the police officers because they do an incredible job and you know a highly dangerous job. So I you know respect what they do and have empathy for their for their jobs and the things that they face every day. And so that's what I didn't want. To, I didn't want to seem insulting to them and their and their job and their members. And um, uh, the, after the first season, I was directing an episode of of Mox or of uh, Rabbit Fall in Saskatoon and I was staying in my hotel and this guy comes saddling up to me and he's like dressed like a biker. He's got a vest on and stuff. And I'm looking over and he, he gives me the old uh, up and down and he goes, oh yeah. And I went, uh oh, <laughs> I think he recognizes me. So I say hello and he goes, you're, you're that guy on that show, right? And I go, yep, <laughs> I am that guy on that show. And he goes, oh, I just want to let you know that I'm, uh, I'm the chief of police of this, I forget the town he named. And uh, I said, oh, yeah. And he goes, I just want to let you know that uh, really like your job. <laughs> you did really good. You remind me of a lot of the members I work with. So, you know, they gave me the, the seal of approval. And actually, one of, one of the storylines, one of the storylines when I accidentally tased myself mm -hmm. in the hand, security yep. cam, I think it was called. Yep. And uh, I was in Jasper, driving through Jasper, and I stopped. And all of a sudden, I see this cop car crawling by, an RC cop car. And then it turns around and it comes up and whipping up to me. And I'm going like, uh-oh, now what? <laughs> and uh, the guy uh, rolls down his window and goes, hey, Davis. I go, I go yeah. <laughs> he goes, you know, this guy here, he's shooting, thumbing at his partner. And his partner just hangs his head and starts shaking his head. He goes, 
yeah, he tased himself like you did on that show. And I went, oh, nice. So it was based in reality. You know, I thought I made it up, but mm -hmm. apparently the young guy, uh, the young guy, uh, he, uh, in training, he accidentally, he didn't wait for it. He reloaded before it was fully discharged. So it still had a charge. He put, he's loading up the pads on the thing and he actually, he tased himself. <laughs> well, the member's got a good laugh at that. And, yeah, I've been, I've been, uh, I was in Beaver Lodge, Alberta, uh, doing a school tour there, talking to kids. And uh, I, I rounded the corner and there were like six cops in the hallway. And I immediately flattened myself against the wall. <laughs> going, oh, what's going on? <laughs> and, uh, and, they, they, and they all came just to hear me speak and, and talk and stuff and to meet me. So I shook their hands, took pictures and, you know, because I have nothing but respect for the job that they do. So mm -hmm. it was nice of them to come out and they, and they all, they all love Davis. So mission accomplished. <laughs> I didn't, uh, I didn't, you know, be disgrace or uh, insulting in my portrayal of them. So it was awesome. Nice. And, and I've hung out with, you know, Paul Gross, Paul Gross and I, when we, we did a thing, in 2005, the centennial, when the Queen came mm -hmm. to Edmonton, and we're at the Commonwealth Stadium, and uh, Paul and I were co-hosting the event and introducing all the acts and stuff, and and uh, as we were doing our rehearsal, uh, we heard behind us this thundering thing, we looked behind, it's all the RC guys on doing the RCMP charge on their horses, right? So, of course, my genetic memory kicked in, and I ran. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? <laughs> So I got the hell out of the way. And then uh, they came by later and uh, going, oh, yeah, they're, you know, and they came and they kind of pushed past Paul Gross and went, hey, Davis. And I went, oh, new cop in town, right? And so he was like, oh, you should come after me. So it's good. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, in yeah. regards to the, to your work this past year, like you said, FBI's most, want, most wanted, uh, Corner Gas Animated. Do you feel like uh, this year, especially, we're seeing the importance of the arts, whether it's TV, movies, theater, things like that, to kind of uh, get us through tough times like this? Well, uh, I think the the the, t the TV is is uh, is helping us out a lot in that regards of getting people to watch and escape. But it's also making it very difficult for us to work as artists. Mm -hmm. uh, the theater community has taken a hard hit because we have to be together to work together. And it's hard to do a show when you're in a bubble. I've done a couple of Zoom play readings and it's, you know, it's interesting uh, exploring the new media, but it's totally not the same. It's hard to get eye to eye contact when, when you have to look at a camera lens as opposed to a person, you know, and mm -hmm. so it's missing a gap. So that's the big challenge. And, um, but it is, it is nice because the, the medium of TV and, and uh, audio books are, are helping people get through this time and reruns. People are watching a lot of the Corner Gas reruns, the action, live action and the movie. And so that's awesome. And uh, the other show that I do is uh, Molly of Denali, uh, which is uh, a PBS show, which won a Peabody last year for, mm. its, for its show for youth programming. So, you know, and those shows, especially Molly, I really love because it, it's, it's making, it's helping kids ask questions that their parents have to answer. Like this one mm -hmm. episode uh, with some of the characters were talking about our ancestors and we're talking to little Molly about our ancestors so she can understand. And I was told this story, this, this couple down in Texas were watching the show. And then the, after the show was done, their, their little daughter came up and said, Mom, Dad, do we have ancestors? And it's like, oh man, that's awesome. So they're now they're forced to answer that and talk to their kids about their family history and connecting on that level, you know. And I love, you know, that's the purpose of this medium is to get people to interact, not just to dull the mind, but to cause conversation, to cause reaction, to cause interaction. So it's, you know, it's 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 wonderful when that happens, when you when you're allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there that is meant to dull your mind, <laughs> but there is some stuff that out there that makes you, makes you enjoy like the corner gas. I love the fact that grandparents and grandkids can watch the show together and mm -hmm. they can laugh together and just laughing together is good medicine. Absolutely. That brings a uh, family unit closer together when you're able to laugh with each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you prefer, what, is there like, do you prefer live action to, to voice acting? Uh, or do you like equal both or do they both have kind of their benefits and disadvantages? 
Yeah, they, they both have their benefits. I, I love them both. They both require a different set of skills. So we're always shifting gears and, and fine tuning when I go from uh, to doing an animated to doing an audio book, which uh, I've, I've done a few lately. And it's a, it's a big challenge doing talking for four hours at a time and trying to keep uh, people involved auditorially. Mm -hmm. So there's a challenge there. You know, you have to have some some physical stamina to keep the pace at a certain pace, and uh, you know the pitch not too high, not too low. You know, you can't dull people to sleep. You have to keep them focused on the story and keep trying mm -hmm. to draw them in and keep them listening. You know, so that's a that's a, a big challenge, and I and I love doing that because I love challenges and exercising my other skills that I have, and I love directing as well. I mean, everything has its it has its um, charm i would mm -hmm. say because i love direct i love working with actors i love working with uh uh up and coming actors and and learning lots from older veteran actors and uh and learning lots from the crew you know mm -hmm. you're know, working with guys who have been uh, like a dop for 40 years you can learn a <laughs> thing or two from from those guys who've seen it all and done it all and if you mm -hmm. want to learn ask them questions you know and they'll go <laughs> oh okay <laughs> you know, so that's what I love doing is just getting in that environment. And it, and it harkens back to my rugby days when I played for the Strathcona Druids. Mm -hmm. That was my, my first team I played with. And, and those rugby skills I've taken with me into on stage and directing as well. Because when you're directing, the director is the team captain. The buck mm -hmm. stops here. And it's up to me to keep the, everyone focused and heading in the same directions, putting out fires as they come up and, uh, and trying to uh, uh, draw out uh, performances from from these, uh, you know, from from the actors. You can mm -hmm. hear it in the microphone when they're telling the truth and when they're not. And that's what I listen <laughs> for. Going, oh, okay, let's let's try that again. But let's just try it with a little bit of this, a little <laughs> bit of that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then just my last question is, what do you got coming up for 2021? It's kind of hard to say with COVID, you know, everything's up in the air. But any projects? Any I, you mentioned uh, through and through, but anything coming up uh, next year? Um, I, I, I think I've talked my way into a couple of shows at Stratford. So I'm hoping that'll work out. That's, that's on my bucket list <laughs> of things to do is to work at Stratford because it's one of the, you know, premier Shakespeare mm -hmm. festivals in, in our country. So, uh, I'd love to work there. So I phoned up, uh, the, uh, artistic director and said, Hey, uh, I'm a little cardinal and this is my, my you know, as I do this and they go, Oh no, we've, we've heard of you. We, we know who you are. And they're like, Oh. Good. Well, I want to come play. He says, oh, okay. Well, that'd be awesome. And so he says, we're doing a couple of plays and uh, here's some options that uh, you know, do one or the other. And and because of COVID too, the Stratford's taken a big hit because they weren't able, able to produce a season. And um, and uh, so they're when, when they're up and running again, they're going to do a season, but it's going to be under a tent outside of their theaters that they have there. And it's going to be uh, limited seating because, you know, it'd be socially distant seating. So maybe a hundred people under the big top. So that's going to be, uh, that harkens back to the beginning of Stratford when they did it under the big top, when it started in 1964 or whatever it was, mm -hmm. 64, 67, I think they started. And they did all their shows before they had the theaters. They did them in big top tents out, out on the grounds there. So it, it's going to be a, a new beginning. We're going to start again, and then hopefully by then the vaccine will be more readily available and we'll be able to, uh, you know, um, be together again in, a, in an audience on stage and in, in the audience. So mm -hmm. I look forward to those days because it's very symbiotic. You can't have a great play without an audience. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. Because they, they play they play a part in all, all the productions that, we, you know, all the stage productions that we do. You, you need an audience to make things work. Mm -hmm. That's who we do it for. So 